So there's a, a lot that happens in a church family uh, over the course of six, seven, eight months, nine months that we've been in the middle of COVID. And uh, it's not always been easy to communicate with our church family some of the things that have been going on. This afternoon, around noon today, we said goodbye to uh, Dan Lutz. Dan and Sandy are part of our church, have been for almost 20 years. And on April 26th, Dan made a personal visit to heaven. And he hasn't come back. I think he's staying. I really do. And uh, yet for Sandy, that's a, there's grief and there's sorrow and sadness. But we had just a wonderful time today celebrating his life and celebrating the confident knowledge that he is with Jesus. And he's enjoying him in a wonderful personal way. So as you see Sandy, if you know Sandy uh, along the way, um, encourage her. Pray for her if you don't know her. Um, but that's just what has happened in our, in our family. It's like real stuff that is, has gone on. So I thought you would want to know that. So last week, we started a series that we called The King and His Cross. And uh, it's, uh, we're going to take some time to look at an eyewitness account of Jesus' life through the eyes of Mark or Peter. We'll talk about that a little bit. It's uh, the most amazing account of Jesus' life from somebody who uh, tells the story of having been in close proximity. There are four of these accounts altogether, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're looking at the one that's called Mark, and uh, it's the one that is recorded closest to the events themselves of Jesus' life, but it's still about 30 years from the time that Jesus has that fateful and fantastic Friday, Saturday, Sunday in Jerusalem. And uh, the reason it's being told, being written down, is that the eyewitness accounts for the first 30 years after it happened passed things down orally, but they're at an age and a stage in life where they're also kind of passing on, and so they know they need to get it written down, and one of the guys that tells his story is Peter, and in all likelihood, he's uh, dictating his story to John Mark, who puts his name on this particular account, but in all likelihood, it's Peter telling John Mark what to write down. And uh, last week when we looked at it, we started right in with the core truth of what Peter had on his mind to communicate through this whole letter. And what I want to do tonight is I want to overlap last week just a little bit and then go on to another part of the story. So we're going to pick up the couple of verses from last week and then carry on. This is Mark chapter 1 uh, in verse 14. It says, later on, Jesus went into Galilee where he preached God's good news. The time promised by God has come at last, Jesus announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. And then he goes on. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I'll show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little further up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, James and John, in a boat repairing their nets. He called them at once, and they also followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. Let me start here. When I was a little kid, I think maybe six, seven, eight years old, something like that, we played a game called Simon Says. Have you heard of it? Who's heard of it? Yes? The majority. Have you played it? Yeah, probably as a little kid. So if you haven't, here's the deal. In this game, a player takes the role of Simon, and he issues instructions, usually like physical kind of instructions, like stick your tongue out or uh, jump in the air, those kinds of things. And the other players are supposed to follow, but they only follow if he preempts it with Simon says. If he doesn't say Simon says but gives instructions, they're not supposed to do anything. The other thing that happens, if he says Simon says and gives them a task they can't do, either way, something happens because it's the object of the game. The object of the game is to eliminate the other players. That's what Simon is trying to do. And the winner, if he eliminates everybody or the last person standing, gets to be Simon the next round, and he gets to be Simon Says. You know the game, right? What you might not know that is according to legend, this game is about as old as the Gospel of Mark way back in the first century of Rome. And it goes back to this guy, Marcus Tilius Cicero. There he is right there, game inventor. Uh, here's a little bit of history. Cicero was a, a revered statesman and an orator and academic. 
along with being a kind of a high profile, prolific writer with pithy and wise sayings. He became quite well known and developed a national following within the Roman Empire. People had uh, this kind of mantra when it came to Cicero's writings, and it was, Cicero says, do this. And then they would repeat some quote that he had done, and it was kind of a national mantra that was going around. However, what nobody knew was that these were actually subversive quotes trying to undermine Caesar and foment a rebellion against him. So legend has it that within a hundred or so years of Cicero's life, a game developed called Cicero Says. Amazing what you find out when you come to church, right? This is critical information. In this case, it was Cicero rather than Simon would say something and people were expected to do it. And it really was an ongoing attempt to undermine the government of the time, uh, to eliminate, if you will. So why do I tell you other than to spark a craze of Simon Says? Well, there's a reason here. As a kid, and I don't know exactly where this developed because it's so terribly wrong, but somehow along the way as a young child, but then even into my young adult years, I developed an idea that faith and Christian faith was a giant version of Simon Says, except it was Jesus Says. You know, Jesus says, go to church. Jesus says, read your Bible. Jesus says, give your money. Jesus says, be nice to people. Jesus says, pray every day. Jesus says, don't look at her. Not like that. Jesus says. And I would try really, really hard to concentrate and do what Jesus says. Mm, but then when I didn't, I felt I was probably eliminated from the game. And so I would just get out of the game altogether, and actually life seemed a little easier when I did that. Then I would go to Jesus Says Church, or Jesus Says Camp, and I would feel so guilty about what I was doing that I was out of the game that I'd get back into the game again and make a whole new commitment to do what Jesus says. Anybody with me on this one? Mm -hmm. Or if I was in the Jesus says game and felt good about that, and I saw others weren't playing, well, I'd get all judgmental and I'd try to guilt them to get in the game with me. You know, if I'm going to be miserable, you are too, right? You need to do what Jesus says. If you don't do what Jesus says, and I would have some answer for them. Or the other side, I would be jealous of others who were playing the game at a higher level than me. I know, this is wrong, it's crazy. It was just simply a disaster and <laughs> burdensome and frustrating. And I really just wanted out but felt too guilty to stay out. Maybe this is why you dropped out of church or you have given up or you've just stopped being part of a religious group because it was a do, 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 don't, don't, don't. Jesus says, Jesus says. And you realize you just weren't very good at it. And you were told that you weren't disciplined enough or you just didn't get it. And so you just stepped out. And you thought, well, if I go to hell, at least I'll be there with a lot of friends. It was into a very, very similar world and environment that Jesus came into and gave a message that was meant to blow up that idea that humans would never, ever live under that Simon says, or Jesus says kind of life ever again. That was what he meant to do. Jesus brought a message into the world that would end that. It would no longer be Cicero says, or Simon says, or Caesar says, or Zeus says, Athena, or Apollos says. Not even the law of Moses says. Pharisees and scribes say, lawyers and Sadducees, nobody. Uh -uh. It wouldn't even be a Jesus said kind of environment. And I think it's for this reason why Mark gets what Jesus taught and modeled, and right at the front end of what he's gonna tell us about Jesus' life, he puts that down and says, I need you to get that. You have to get this, or you're gonna go into that loop that Jesus came to stop and get rid of. And so he tells us very simply what Jesus had on his mind and what his message was. This is how he starts in verse 14. He says, later on, Jesus went into Galilee, and here's what he had on his mind. He preached the good news. 
Now, I point out the good news in red, but the original version in Greek would have used the word gospel. Well, in our day, we might use that word almost exclusively in a religious setting. That word that was used, the gospel word, was in fact a very common Greek word not exclusively used within religious practices. In fact, till Jesus' followers came along, it was never used in that kind of context. In fact, there is a inscription from the era of the first century in Rome that shows how it was used in Greek culture as an inscription under Caesar Augustus' statue that says the beginning of the gospel of Caesar Augustus. It simply stated that the monument marked the good news that there was a new Caesar in Rome and on Rome's throne. It was just a statement, news is some newsworthy action or item or event has happened. So gospel was simply a news report. That's what it was. Mind you, a very good news report that some kind of very significant event had occurred that was going to be really beneficial to those getting the news. It was a news report of a coronation or a royal birth or a major military victory over an enemy and the event that would change your life for the better. So sit up and take notice. It's a significant event. It'll change history. It'll change the future. It'll reshape your destiny. Good news. And Mark deliberately uses this term. And it is the essence of the good news that is just this. It is very simply put, it is a news report of some good that is happening. Jesus is telling people about a news story that happened. Why should that matter? Well, this is Jesus' defining st statement that differentiates him and his message from all other religions, philosophies, and creeds. Can I say that again? What Jesus taught was different, radically different, than any other teacher had ever brought in any other religion, any other philosophy, or any other creed. You see, all other religions are at their core advice, or Simon says religions, where at the core of Jesus' message was simply news of an event. So it's this contrast between advice and news. Everybody else brought advice to follow. Jesus alone brings a message, there's something that happened. I'm not giving you advice. I'm telling you about something that happened, and it's good news, and it changes the world. The core of all other religions are do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that, and you'll be good with God. In other words, the essential message of all other religions is Simon says, Muhammad said, Brahma says, Confucius says. And if we're not careful... Our Christian faith becomes Jesus said, and that's not what he intended. The essential message Jesus gives was news, not advice. Not advice as to what you must do to be good with God, but news about what has been done already for you. News, not advice. Now certainly, Christianity is chock full of great ideas. How you should live well, or how the news ought to affect us. But it is not, certainly not in the New Testament, the essential or critical part that it is with every other religion. The key thing is the news about what has happened. Here's the news. You are rescued and good with God, not because of what you do, but because of what he did. You're rescued and you're good with God because of his record, not your record. And if you'll believe that, this is the message that Jesus brings. This is why it is essential that we have a news paradigm of Jesus' message, not an advice paradigm, because his advice simply won't grip us. But the news of an event has the opportunity and the potential to take over our lives. We're asked to believe a news story not an advice column. And this is the news that Jesus delivered. Verse 15 says, the time promised by God, this is what he said, the time promised by God has come at last. Here's the news event. The kingdom of God is near. 
In other words, Jesus' news was that as of now, this moment, that is what near means, the way God has always wanted things to be is how they are going to be from here forward. And they are. Just like he invented the creative design of the Garden of Eden where he would live with his people face to face in this fantastic location. And then it got all corrupted generation after generation. Jesus coming in and said the news. I want to give you some news. It's different as of today. As of today, it changes. That picture you had of the garden where the father would walk with you and live with you in close personal harmony is now about to come. It's not going to come all at once, but it's going to come. It starts with my incarnation. That's the first time I came, and it's going to come to completion when I come in judgment. That's the second time I come. Between now and then, it's coming, and it's here, and it's on the way, and it's being grown and being developed. It's here, not entirely here, but it's here. That's the news event. Does that make you yawn? It shouldn't. What he is saying is that what we long for one day, like I talked about Dan experiencing right now since April the 26th, he would say, you can have that, a part of that, a piece of that now already because of an event that happened. Well, there's more good news. You actually can participate and be an active person as a resident in this kingdom. And it's a very, very simple way that's proven to be extremely hard for people. It really has. He goes on in verse 15, he says, the kingdom is near, and he says, repent of your sins. Now that seems relatively easy, doesn't it? That's not so hard. It's like saying, I'm sorry, I won't do it again, right? Or, look, hey, I I know I'm not perfect. Or, I'm going to try harder going forward. Nope. Now, I mean, that, that would be easy for us. That would be so easy. What it is, is it's entirely rethinking who's in charge of my life and who do I follow and who directs my decision making and who do I obey and who do I rely on and who determines my use of time, my money, who determines my sexuality and who has captured my imagination and who do I not want to live one minute of life without. That's what rethinking is. Certainly, it involves looking at my life and saying, I've lived independent of God, and that's created a separation from God for sure. But it's more than that. It's a rethinking of who's in charge of my life. And this is what we're invited to do to live in the kingdom. We're going to have to repent and think about who that is. In other words, it's an invitation to get off the throne of my life and turn that seat of authority over to Jesus fully, completely, forever, increasingly. As it, as it is, it turns out to be not so, so easy, simple. For we have proven over and again that's hard to do for throne lovers. It really is. But that's the news that it can be done. And then to kind of wrap up the essentials of how Jesus' good news report becomes personal, and how we can participate in his kingdom. When we give up and we give in, we do it because we believe. It's a choice that we have. We actually don't have to. But love, as we said last weekend, necessitates a choice, a real choice with options. And this is what we have. We have a real choice with options. And the way in is to believe, not the advice but to believe that the event not only happened, but we put the full weight of our lives on the truth that that event happened and the implications for it. This is how Jesus said himself. He says, the kingdom is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Rely on it. Don't just believe it happened. Believe on the implications of it. So great is God's love and so real is the freedom to choose that you can go your entire life and not choose yes. Did you know that? You can go your entire life and not say yes to Jesus' invitation. And then you can go throughout eternity and never say yes to his invitation. Sometimes we think that in the end, when Jesus comes back a second time, we're just all going to make it there. We're all going to end up in that place called heaven. But I want to ask you a sobering question, okay? If 
that's not been your desire your whole life long, to do life with Jesus? Where's the logic that says when I die and wake up in heaven, I'm suddenly going to want to do life with him when I'm right there in his potent presence all the time? What makes us think that's going to happen? Do you think God would be loving enough to say, I understand you said no your whole life. I get that. I gave you that freedom. That's what love does. And then I'm going to let you live eternity without it too. And that's your choice. It's not my choice. The invitation was open to your last breath. But don't be fooled. If you didn't want to do anything with me here, I doubt you want to do anything with me in heaven. It won't be a good place for you. And so he invites, he pleads, he longs, he begs, he cajoles, he does whatever he can to say, pick now. Don't wait. Because I want you to have this full life now, right here, today. And this is why his message is so urgent and why I believe Mark starts with it right from the very beginning and makes it clear what this is about. There's something on the line. It's not just a feel-good story. There's actually something on the line here of great significance, of great importance. However, if you do choose here, if you do say yes here, you are going to find that it was more than what you thought it was. Wait till you get to heaven then. And you're going to see what the wow factor of heaven is and how close it came on earth to that. And then finally, after Jesus lays this out or Peter or Mark laid out for us, we finally get to the place where we meet the main character after Jesus in this book. Haven't met him yet, but we are going to now. This is how it starts in verse 16. It says, One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon. That's Peter. That's his name. And his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me. Underline it. And I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little further up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, James and John, in a boat, repairing their nets. He called to them at once and And they also followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. Now, the reason I highlight follow or followed is because it's different than what any other religious leaders throughout history have recruited people to. Just like it's news, not advice, what religious leaders throughout the ages have invited people to is to come and follow their philosophy, their view, their ideas. Jesus comes along and says, ah, I want you to follow me, not the ideas, not the theology, not that. Follow me. You'll get that other stuff. But I don't want to create a Simon says kind of faith where you follow my advice and you follow what I say. I'm asking you to personally follow. Come, come follow me. Come be with me. This was the simple way that Jesus approached everyone. Rich and poor, educated, uneducated, outcasts, insiders, just simply, come follow me. What did he mean with that? He meant, come follow me. That's what he meant. Come follow me. I'm simply inviting you to come follow me. And let's do life together. Now, I'll bet When those words were spoken, when they came out of Jesus' mouth, there was an audible gasp. Did he really say that? It can't be that simple. And you can't have someone like Peter be a candidate for it. It doesn't work. Three reasons why. Well, Peter was a very unlikely candidate. He was a fisherman who, as a kid, would have enrolled in rabbi school at four, five, or six years of age, and he likely didn't get out of first grade. And he was asked to leave rabbi school. How do I know that? Oh, I don't know when it happened, but I know he's fishing. The goal was to be a rabbi. Every little Jewish boy and every little Jewish boy's family's dream was that they would become a rabbi. That was what you wanted. Now, it was a very, very uh, tense education to go through. It was comprehensive, and you had to memorize so many things, and few little boys made it. And Peter evidently didn't make it. 
And now he's got a second shot at graduate level rabbi school. What a break for an unlikely guy. Second reason it was unlikely is that rabbis didn't pick their followers. They didn't. Potential followers applied and pursued the rabbi they wanted to follow because only a very, very small number would ever successfully or even wanted to because to follow didn't just mean randomly, periodically, sporadically follow. It meant to be part of that rabbi's band, his posse. It meant leaving your life as you know it and live with the rabbi or do as he did or go where he went to eat what he ate, to dis- take on the disciplines that he took on. It was an incredible honor and cup with a huge commitment. Third reason why it was shocking what Jesus does is there was no precondition to Peter joining. He did not have to have enough money. He did not have to have influence. He didn't have to come from the right family. He was just invited as he was. It's like this. This is not how Jesus does it. Peter, if you're willing to fill in the blank, then you can follow me. If you're willing to stop something, start something, if you're willing to do these three steps or those eight pillars or give, I'll give you an assignment and see how you do in three weeks. No, it was just a straightforward, Peter, come and follow me. Would you come follow me? What exactly did it mean to follow? Well, it meant follow, like I said. It meant to be a student, a learner. Like the idea of an apprentice, we use that along a lot here. It meant every day, doing every part of life with Jesus. Go where I go, experience what I experience, spend every waking and sleeping moment with me because you're going to increasingly think like I do just by being with me. We'll eat together, we'll sleep in the same house together, enjoy the same entertainment together, hang out with the same friends, simply do life together, and as we do, you'll increasingly think like me, and then you'll use your time and you use your money and your abilities and your future and your family and your marriage and your job. You just think about the whole thing like I do. And then, if you follow long enough in the same direction, you'll eventually act like I do, not because you're trying to mimic me. It's just what you're going to do. Jesus does not invite them to obey him, to let them teach him, to let them coach him, to tell them what to do, to advise them. He simply says, follow me. They'll find that other stuff out, but simply follow me. I'm wondering, this might be a good question to ask, am I following? Am I a follower of Jesus Christ? Well, the answer to that, you might have three possible answers to that. You might have others, but here's the three that I think of. Some of us might be honest enough to say, I'm actually not a follower. I'm I'm not. Uh, I'm not even sure that I could be. I mean, I, I I don't think I have enough knowledge, and there must be at least some minimal entry requirements to be a follower, some like behavior standard before we qualify. Some would say, I'm actually not that interested in my life at this point. I'm full of doubt. I tried it once before and really got burned by it, and I'm not into it any longer. I've got someone close in my life that would say because of something that happened in his life, he's become a cynic, and he's not a follower. And he's honest about not being a follower. Well, here's the thing. Everybody who's ever become a follower started out as a non-follower. There's no other way to become a follower. You all have to start. We all have to start that way. But the thing is, you don't start to follow and uh, you, don't, you don't change and then begin to follow. You follow and then begin to change. So you might identify yourself as a non-follower. You might identify yourself as a follower. The second group are those who would identify themselves as followers. They're oddly, they're not very religious. Uh, they don't appear to be super disciplined in many ways. They seem to be at ease and confident and humble. They seem to live their lives with a unique rest, though they do a lot of things. There's a peace about them. Uh, They're honest about their fears and failures and somehow live through them and live beyond them. There's a certain presence about their lives that's unique. They're not immune to chaos and disappointment and missteps and mistakes and failures. That's part of it. But there's a confident restfulness about them. 
because they're following someone who they know is bigger than them, who doesn't expect perfection from them, but expects increasingly as you walk with me, as you do all of life with me, I'll do the changing. I'll do the transformation. Got to be honest where you are. Just follow, follow. That's a follower. And then there's a middle category that causes me a great deal of concern. And that's what I would define as a non-following follower. If you were to turn to the book of Revelation, you would see that it's, this person is described as someone who's neither hot nor cold, lukewarm. This is a person who would self-identify as a Christian or a follower. They might call themselves that, but Jesus actually has very little to do with their lives. They seldom, if ever, find themselves alone with Jesus asking and then waiting for him to give them whatever he would want to give them, whatever he would want to speak into their lives. They're too busy. They're too rushed. There's not the peace in their, t- in their world to just carve out time to simply be with the one they claim they follow. They're hoping he'll catch up to them. Yes, they do look for him when the heat is on and they're desperate but it just tends not to be just a daily rhythm to their lives. It would be odd for them to consult with Jesus about their next purchase or their next adventure or their next commitment or the next use of their time for something. See, that's up, that's up to them to decide that. In fact, the idea of doing that is a brand new thought. Does anybody actually live like that? or their marriage, or close friendship. It's in turmoil, and rather than reach out to Jesus for guidance and help, they tough it out. And they think they're just strong enough to do it. Or they call Dr. Phil for help. Or how about this? How they raise their children. It's left to the cultural norms and the cultural expectations. And they long for them to be academic, athletic, and artistic stars but they don't help them become little followers of Jesus because their parents aren't that themselves. And secretly, we're more concerned that they get a scholarship and then have a passionate love than they are to have a passionate love for Jesus. Parents are our greatest, our greatest calling. Our greatest calling is to create little followers of Jesus. Non-following followers have a pace that leads to disintegration. Disintegration. Things come apart. I want what Jesus offers, but I don't want him in charge. I want peace and contentment and confidence, but I want to decide that for myself. This is not about being a perfect follower. This is about someone who's learning to be a follower. Learning to be a follower. In verse 18 and 20, I'll finish with this. The two groups of people that are invited to come and follow Jesus were told that they followed right away. And then they had to leave something. One of them left the nets and followed, and the other left their dad and followed. So you can't follow and not leave something. What keeps you from following, from simply saying yes to Jesus' invitation? Is there a relationship that you love more than you love the thought of following? Is there a habit or an addiction? We have help for for you. We have a restoration project that will help with that. Is there a hobby or a distraction? I've got a friend who's an Ironman fanatic. And if you would ask him today, he would say, yep, I follow the Ironman culture around the world. No, I'm a Christian, understand. But Iron Man's captured my passion. It's captured my interest. And in essence, he's a non-following follower. Is it fear? Is it cash accumulation? There's a rich guy in the Bible that Jesus comes to who's longing to be a follower, and Jesus says, well, get rid of the stuff you have because that's what's keeping you from being a follower. Are there past disappointments? I don't know what category you would put yourself in, but that would really be the question tonight. Are you a follower? Are you a non-follower? Or would you say, I'm a non-following follower? Jesus invites us to follow. To follow. It's as simple as that and as hard as that. Now, Jesus, 
Uh, you invited us, and you do invite us, to be followers. Uh, I would ask you tonight that we might have the courage to stop long enough and ask, how would I define myself? Have I said yes to this invitation to follow you, to actually follow you with my life, to learn from you, to be your apprentice, to take direction and guidance and get hope from and courage from, where you actually are, are you, you're the one that shows the way through and leads to the place you want to take us. Would you help us to be honest about this, take it to you, and see what you would share with us. Turn us into a band of followers, Jesus, just like your friends did, faultingly, imperfectly, but they changed the world by being followers of yours. Do that among us, we pray. Amen.